Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are Team Cirrhosis, and this is our final demonstration for Booze Deck, our senior design project. All right, so let's start with a little bit of background. Why are drink making machines desired? Overall, the answer is simplicity. The biggest example of a drink making machine is a Keurig. These are desired over a traditional coffee pot because they're quick, easy to use, and have some options available. Our customer wants a machine that makes alcoholic beverages with the same, same aspects. So our customer wants a machine that will quickly make drinks, quicker than if you were to mix the drinks by hand, something that's easy to use, simply essentially push a button and the drink will be made, but also there'll be less dishes when you're making the drinks with the machine like this, and perhaps a few options available, such as beverage size or drink strength. And here's our problem statement. Our challenge is to design a device with an integrated recipe library that could make martinis, Manhattans, and other mixed beverages quickly and consistently. Here are some of the relevant standards that apply to Booze Stack. Booze Stack was designed for private and not commercial use, and thus not intended for the sale or barter of liquor or other alcoholic beverages. In addition, users are prompted to verify they are over the age of 21 every time the machine is used. And here is Booze Stack in all of her glory. One thing to note, since UCCS is a dry campus, all bottles are filled with water in this in all demonstrations in this video. We would never break any rules by testing with alcohol on campus. This is a broad overview of Boost Stack. First, the user interfaces with the machine, i.e. makes their selections, via a touchscreen connected to the Raspberry Pi. The brains of this operation is provided by a Raspberry Pi 4. Following a drink order input, the Pi, which is connected to two stepper motor drivers, one for the horizontal axis and one for the vertical axis, will move the dispensing arm along the horizontal axis until it is under the appropriate ingredient before stopping. Upon stopping, the other stepper driver, driving a motor on a screw, screw drive linear actuator, will move up, pushing and holding the ingredient dispenser until up to 30 milliliters, or one ounce, is dispensed. The cycle is repeated as many times as necessary for the number of ingredients that are in the drink the user ordered. Powering this is a 24-12 5-volt power supply with 24 volts driving the motors and 5 volts powering the Pi and touchscreen. The motors are NEMA 23 motors rated for up to 4 amps. Here is an overview of the testing strategy employed for the testing of Boostack. Our first concern is that the GUI uh, can operate properly. Can screens of the GUI be easily navigated? What happens when the user says they are under 21? Can the GUI handle what is listed in the requirements? We also have to test the communication chain between the GUI and the machine. Does the user input prompt the machine properly? Do the motors travel to where they're expected? The next thing we need to test is the consistencies in the dispenses. This involves using the motors to dispense shots from each dispenser to check for inconsistencies. We need to make sure the shots are consistent in volume and that the reservoir is refill after each dispense. Last, we need to test this machine uh, can be run repeatedly without breaking itself. We need to check for any unwanted friction or if it's hitting itself anywhere or if there's any leaky dispensers or anything along those lines. Here is a compilation of the test results we have so far. In the first stage of testing, we found that the dispensers for the machine were not refilling their reservoirs every time a shot was dispensed. It was seemingly, re it was seemingly random whether the reservoirs would refill or not. So at this point, we're feeling a bit defeated and we're like, what do we do? But our good old uh, project manager, Ray, found online that other people had been also having um, problems with the reservoirs of those dispensers refilling consistently. Uh, Ray found that uh, if you were to tilt the bottles to either side a certain amount of degrees, it would cause the reservoirs to fill much more consistently. 
so we decided to make this change before our second stage of testing and our second stage of testing was way more successful than the first stage so thanks Ray for finding that information for us however we were still getting um, a very undesirable refill rate for the dispensers so we decided to try uh, messing with the motor speed a bit to see if we could get a more consistent refill rate so our good old uh, advisor Dr. Lindsay told us to try slowing down the motors on the release of the dispenser to see if that would help the refill rate. And so we tried that and it worked. Our refill rate went down even more. So stage three of testing was basically tweaking our motor speed to see if that could get us a more consistent refill rate. And that worked very well for us. Um, so throughout testing, we were also weighing um, our dispenses to see if we were getting consistent volumes of dispenses from each nozzle. So you can see we have about a 92% accuracy rate um, with an average error of 12.1 milliliters per dispense. The average time to make a regular drink is about 60 seconds, um, like a minute, and the time to make a batch drink is about two and a half minutes. Um, so we actually did break something while testing the machine, which speaks to our structural integrity originally. Um, originally, we had an arm with a 30% fill, and it broke when trying to dispense liquid from the dispensers. And we replaced it with an arm with an 80% fill. The arm with the 80% fill is much, much stronger, and we don't see it breaking anytime soon. Now we're going to compare some of our original specifications to the testing results that we've obtained. So the table on the left is showing the quantitative specs and the table on the right is showing the qualitative specs. We color coded the entries to indicate whether we met the spec or not. So green indicates that we did meet the spec. Yellow indicates that we met the spec, but we did not hit our nominal target that we were aiming for. And red indicates that we did not meet the spec. In terms of quantitative specifications, the one that we really did not meet was the overall length of the machine. This is because in the original design, we only measured the length of the aluminum frame, and we didn't consider the placement of the Raspberry Pi touchscreen or the hardware junction box at that point. Since these are sitting next to the machine, next to the aluminum frame, they add about 20.5 centimeters to exceed the overall projected maximum length. In addition, we wanted drinks to be ready in 45 seconds in order to compete with solutions that exist commercially. However, our regular drink requires 62 seconds to make and the batch requires 155 seconds. As of now, we're working on tuning the motor speeds to try to reduce this time. However, in the testing phase, we did notice that we were limited um, about the timing because the vertical motor needs to move very slowly when it depresses and releases the bottle nozzle for the reservoir to refill correctly. As for the qualitative specifications, the only one that we did not include in the design, in the final design, was the indicator light. And this is because in early March, we started having some issues with driving the motors and supplying the correct voltage to the motor drivers. And for that reason, the indicator light became a lower priority feature. And we decided that it would be best to not include that up until this point, because we actually wanted to design an illuminated cup holder. And that would be adding a lot of extra time to the development rather than to the testing phase. As for everything else, we were able to meet most of the specs that we've tested so far, and we have accomplished the functionality that we had desired for the machine, which is to make cocktails up to 32 different combinations, and we can also adjust the strength of the alcohol, creating a customized GUI for the user. Prior to showing the GUI demonstration, we're just going to quickly go over what we're about to see. So the GUI has two interfaces. It's accessed from the Raspberry Pi desktop by double-clicking on an executable file. 
And all of the files for the project are available on GitHub, and the link is shown at the end of this presentation. So in the demonstration, we're going to navigate through both interfaces, where we're going to start from the main page, check the user's age, select one of the interfaces, go through the interface. We can change the recipe if we would like. We'll make the drink, return to the main menu, and then we'll go through the other interface as well. And throughout the process, we'll also explain the differences between the two interfaces and the special features of the GUI. Hi, everyone. So this demo is going to consist of two parts. First, we're going to introduce the GUI, and then we'll show the Boo stack actually making a drink. So what we're seeing here is the Raspberry Pi's desktop. And to launch the GUI, we're just going to double click on the Boo stack launcher. And we have the choice to execute in the terminal or outside. Since I'm not debugging, I'm going to execute outside of the terminal. And the GUI is pulled up. This gap here is not actually seen on the physical touchscreen. This is um, there because we're using a VNC to record this demo. And there's a difference in the geometry between the VNC and the actual touchscreen. So that's not something the user sees. So here we have the main page of the GUI. First, we need to check whether the user is over the age of 21 years old or not. If they select no, the 30 second timeout per hour requirements is initiated and they need to wait this out before they can interact with the machine. So I'm going to pause the recording here and come back after the timeout is finished. Okay, we're back from the timeout. And now I'm going to confirm that I'm over the age of 21. And we have the option to select between two interfaces. The button size of the standard interface is larger because the employees at BlueStack said they would be more likely to use this option. And the flexible would be for special occasions like um, a work party or events. So I'm going to start with the standard interface. And the first thing that the user needs to do is confirm the previous placement of the bottles. And if this has been updated, they can go ahead and change the bottles. So let's say that, for example, Amaretto is now empty. I can change the contents of holder one to being empty. And once I select enter, the next time that a user decides to use this interface, empty will be recorded in holder number one. So as you can see, we are not actually able to make any drinks with this combination of liquors. And so what the user needs to do is go back and change one of the ingredients such that they're able to actually make something. Um, they can also use the flexible interface if they don't really know what they can make because they'll be able to see the breakdown of each ingredient. So this standard user interface would be for people that are con consistently making the same drink over and over again and know what the makeup is. So I'm going to select enter. And we have two options. We can make ABC or French connection. I'm going to go ahead and make French connection. We have two size options, regular and batch, again, per the requirements. So I'm going to make a batch this time. And we can still go back to change the bottles if we would like to, or cancel and return to the home page as well from this point. I'm going to go ahead and continue. And at this point, the user needs to confirm that the ingredients that will be used in the recipe are in fact in those holders. So this is just a reminder of the bottle placement in case that they overlooked it the first time that they were supposed to confirm. So I'm going to select continue. And now they can adjust the percentage makeup if they want to adjust the strength of the drink or if they prefer um, more of one ingredient over the other. So we're going to go ahead and change the recipes. Um, and let's say that we only select 30% for cognac and we leave amaretto at zero. The user will get an error saying that they cannot proceed unless the sum of the ingredients equal 100%. And so this is just to keep consistency with the size of the drink being poured, the volume. So I'm going to change each one of the percentages for cognac and amaretto to 50% and continue on. And 
at this point, they're told which cup they need to place in the, the cup holder. So we have the booze stack cup and the booze stack pitcher. So because we selected batch, they need to place the pitcher with their desired amount of ice into the cup holder. And they can still go back at this point, or they can proceed to make the drink. And at this time, the motors are running. So there's a small delay that was added to this code, but um, this time will be closer to two minutes in most cases. And now they're, uh, they're told that the drink is ready. They can make another or go back to the main page if they select no. If they select yes, they're redirected back to the menu of the interface that they were previously viewing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel from here and go back to the main page. And now we can look at the flexible interface. So with the flexible interface, they have a choice of 32 different drinks that they're able to make. And once they select a drink, so let me select a Manhattan, and I'm going to do a regular this time. Compared to the standard interface, they're actually told where they need to place the ingredients into their respective bottle holders. So in this case, they need to insert sweet vermouth into holder one and bourbon into holder number two. So this would be useful if someone wants to try a different drink that they're not used to drinking and they want to see what is the contents of the, the recipe and maybe go to the store, bring back the ingredients and then make the drink. And for any dry ingredients or any juices, they're prompted to add those after to their taste. So um, in this case, they need to add a dash of bitters after the drink is poured. They can also add a cherry and orange wedge, orange wedge after. Um, and the reason that we needed to do this for fruit juice was again because the nozzles um, that dispense the liquid are prone to clogging from sugar. And so that's something that the user will need to ha have to add after the drink is poured. So I'm going to continue on. This time I'm not going to adjust the percentages of the drink and I'm going to go ahead and make the drink. So this um, is the same as the standard interface. Once it finishes, they can go back to the menu that they were viewing, or they can select no and go back to the main menu. So this time I'm going to select no, and they went back to the, the main page. So next we're going to show the booze stack actually pouring a drink. Thank you. Before we show the demonstration of Booze Stack in action. I want to overview how the machine will pour the cocktail. So first, it will calibrate vertically. The machine will take small steps down and then stop to check the state of the switch. This process will repeat until the switch is pressed and then it will go up a certain distance into the dispense position. Then the machine will calibrate horizontally. It will go left slowly until that bush button is pushed and then calibration will be finished. Next, the machine will go underneath the first bottle holder and check if that ingredient is needed. If so, it will dispense. The machine will then continue going under each next bottle holder. If the ingredient is needed, it will dispense. If the ingredient is not needed, it will skip that bottle holder. Once finished dispensing from the last bottle holder, the machine will then return to the starting position.
We are currently in the testing and characterization phase for tuning and optimization of the machine. Sometimes when we are testing making drinks, there are misses when dispensing. So these should be able to be decreased with small changes to the code. This shouldn't be a very difficult process, but it should be, will probably will be very time consuming. Um, where we were able to complete the second user interface as a reach goal. Jordan worked really hard and fast to be able to complete the second GUI. The second GUI will probably be used most by the customer, so we are very uh, glad to be able to have finished it. We also need to create instructions for how to use the machine. We want to have a small flashcard type instructions to be kept by the machine. The GUI is easy to use and it should be pretty straightforward, but we shouldn't assume this. We should have a quick instruction manual to reference and this will hopefully decrease any misuse of the machine and ensures that anyone who wants to use it can comfortably use it and feel like they know what they're doing. And lastly, we expect to deliver the product uh, to the customer on May 16th. No exact details on what this delivery thing will look like, but hopefully we will be able to give the company a small demo to show off our capstone project. And here is our final project budget. This is an itemized list of everything we bought, including things we didn't use, broke, or wasted. We are allotted $800 for this project. We spent a little over $715, leaving us $84.71 under budget. Something to note, particularly if we are going to continue to produce these machines, is that more than 20% of our budget was spent purchasing materials in quantities greater than needed for the, a single machine. Unfortunately, trying to find these materials singly or in smaller quantities did not provide any substantial savings. On this list, the wire connectors and linear rail were the most expensive bulk purchases for our product. Also, nearly 4% of our budget was just waste. These were items purchased and then not used for boost stack and held longer than the return window allowed. These included a set of micro switches, our first junction box, which was slightly too small, and a larger pulley. The number one takeaway I took from boost stack was the importance of requirements. This means the customer, end user, designers, and engineers all have the same vision for the project. At the end of our requirements review last semester, I was confident that the customer and our team had very specific and thorough design requirements for Boostack. It wasn't until we had already built the initial version of Boostack that we started to see that not only the customer and the team had different interpretations of the requirements, but members of our own team had wildly different views of what our requirements were. We were fortunate and able to work through most of these issues, but I really don't believe you can spend enough time and energy on really hammering out a set of detailed, super specific requirements. Next, I grossly underestimated the importance of project management before this semester, but now I'm convinced that a talented and motivated project manager is worth their weight in gold. This was one of my jobs for Boostack, but I was neither far-sighted nor proactive enough to do it well. If it wasn't for the motivation of my teammates, we would not have completed Boostack this semester. On top of this, the project emphasized the importance of what I call task tailoring. This is the importance of knowing your team and not only their skill sets, but also their skill levels. For example, if someone is a level one or a beginner at soldering, it's critical to explain each step in detail and allot extra time for task completion. Compare this to a level four or expert solderer whose instructions might be simply finish this PCB using surface mount parts in a schematic. A few times during the semester, I expected more out of my teammates than their skill level in a specific task could realistically accomplish, and these miscues ended up costing us time and sometimes hurt feelings. Out-of-scope tasks were a huge time suck. By out-of-scope, I'm referring to tasks for which the team does not have training or experience in. A large part of this project was the design and creation of a machine with parts moving on two axes that had to be strong and sturdy enough to hold large, large quantities of fluid. While we found several similar devices online to use for inspiration, just the creation and troubleshooting of the mechanical parts of this project ate up more, time, more than half the semester. In hindsight, we probably would have been better off contracting someone to design the device and build it so we could spend our time working on the electronics and coding. Hopefully, 
Our project demonstrates the value of having combined senior seminar design with the mechanical engineering department for the future. Lastly, I'll cover the importance of having detailed test plans and realistic timelines. Looking back, we busted nearly every single timeline we established this semester. I'm not sure with our level of experience how you go about making realistic timelines for complex projects, but it isn't a skill I have. Realistic and attainable timelines are important because busting timelines not only slows or halts production further down the line, but it also demoralizes the team. Tying this into test plans, I don't think we allotted enough time to testing. My takeaway for testing from this project would be to allot at least half of the total time for the project to debugging and testing. Some of the key takeaways of mine while working on this project were that each task required more time than expected to complete, so in order to obtain an accurate schedule and set of deadlines, it's really important to dedicate more time than expected to completing each major task. In addition, it would have been helpful if we had dedicated someone on the team to learn about a CAD software such as SOLIDWORKS so that we could verify measurements and show that components would fit together correctly prior to the assembly stage because we did have some issues with incorrect measurements and parts not fitting together properly. Finally, I think that as a team, we could have done a better job of staying organized. Uh, I think we could do this by documenting the team meetings better, maybe creating a Word document and actually typing out the main points so that we would be able to refer back to those if we needed to. During this project, the biggest portion of my work was writing the motor code for BoostDeck. As an electrical engineer, I have limited experience coding and hardly any experience managing a coding project such as this one. I found that code management was very important. I decided to use GitHub so that I could learn it because it's widely used in industry, but also so that I could take advantage of the version control that Git offers. It was really convenient to be able to reference past code sometimes. Another lesson learned is to go to others for help. Although I was writing the majority of the motor code, I asked Jordan for coding help since she has more experience than I do and just knows different things that I do. Together, we came up with solutions much faster and with a better overall algorithm than I could have come up with alone. There was much less frustration on my end when I was coding with a buddy. So buddy coding is a smart coding technique. Lastly, not that feature creep was an issue for our project, but once we designed something, sometimes we would say to ourselves, oh, it'd be cool if we changed this thing. And sometimes it was cooler, but sometimes we said, no, you know, that didn't you know, work out as good as we thought it would in our minds. Let's change it back to how we originally had it. So the project endured many evolutions, as I'm sure most projects do. So it's really important to keep up to date with all the constant changes. Um, so here are some of my lessons learned. Uh, we were really off with the timing of this project. Uh, we ended up starting testing way later than we should, and that's due in part to me not having a good enough test plan in time, and also the machine not actually being ready for testing by the date we needed to start testing it. Um, so that's one thing. Er, when we originally built the machine, I was in charge of doing the electrical wiring, and I just used some of the wires from lab, not realizing that they wouldn't carry enough current to power the motors properly. So. I should uh, take that into consideration next time and do some testing early on rather than just doing integration testing later. This project was a lot bigger than I expected and took a lot more organization skills than I expected. Um, we ended up all over the place a lot of times and I think if we had some better communication and better organization of our um, resources, we probably could have done better on that. To summarize, for our capstone project, we created an automated cocktail machine for the company Bluestack. As of now, we have the machine and the GUI built and interfaced together to pour both a batch size and regular size drink. We're currently in the testing and characterization phase for the batch size drink, and then we'll move towards testing with alcohol. For all of the project files and documentations, please check out the link below. There are, is also a wiki page so that a user would be able to have a walkthrough of how to install the proper libraries and what parts they need for the machine. At this time, please feel free to ask us any questions that you may have.